Okay, so in the second method of creating the structure stiffness uh, matrix by using the direct stiffness method, let, there's a bunch of things you really need to sort of keep in hand all at once, and, and uh, it's helpful to have some sort of big picture of what we're really doing, because we're going to descend down into some nitty-gritty details here, uh, where the big picture could get lost real fast. Ultimately, we're representing the structure in terms of this structural stiffness matrix. Um, we have monitored the structure at specific locations of that continuum at discrete points. Those are in terms of displacements. And then at those specific locations, we have all of the loads that have been applied to the structure represented somehow as equivalent loads at those nodal displacements, the nodal forces at those nodal displacements. So the structure itself is represented by the big capital K, and we're going to solve these simultaneous equilibrium equations for the unknown displacements that happen in response to the applied nodal forces. Now, in method one, we used the imposition of nodal displacements in the particular pattern to create this structure stiffness matrix. In the direct stiffness method, we're going to assemble this directly by looking at element uh, st uh, structures or element uh, stiffness matrices. And so at the local level or the member level, we have a similar equation that we're looking at. And notice here that we've got then capital letters or uppercase represents the global system, the entire system taken all at once. And then lowercase is going to be represented by or it's going to be associated, local cases associated with lower, the, the lower case, right? And some authors will use a little prime here as well. That's a very special uh, uh, meaning that we'll get to at another time. And for right now, you really wouldn't need it. You could think of this as just little k times d times uh, little q. Right now, another thing that, that's important in a general kind of sense to be aware of is in this little local or member or element model, we have a very specific set of axes. And we got to be very careful about what our uh, system is. And so here at the left end, okay, we could call that node 1. We've got then a little local coordinate system. It looks like a Cartesian coordinate system. We'll call it that right there. And then down here at this other one, we've got then likewise a positive coordinate system that looks like so. Now you might call these or label these with a subscript that's a different uh, number that should be associated with the node, node 1, node 2. Some people call these i and j. Um, it'll all be lowercase here, all of these. And some people will just say, well, for a truss element like we're working with here, that x1 and x2 are going to line up. So they'll just call this x, and they'll just call one of these over here uh, y. We're, we're using, by this representation, something a little bit more uh, general. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the generalized stiffness method to coming up with what this element stiffness matrix is. Right? And so <coughs> that would. We could do this a, a slightly different way, but this is a, a fairly typical uh, common way that we might begin to do this. Right? So what that means is that we're going to impose for the nodal displacement set 1 the pattern that is, such a, that is as follows. We're going to put a displacement here at 1. We'll use lowercase. And that's equal to a non-zero value. And at the second one, then, we will have then 0 for that one. So this member has shortened up. And in order for that to happen, we've had to come along, of course, and impose a force. All right now, this is the local system. So we'll call that little q sub 1. Right? And that happens to coincide also with a positive direction. Now, at the other end, I know that in reality I've got to have a Q that goes in the opposite direction. But I'm going to show it acting in the positive direction. In equilibrium, will demand then, of course, that our little Q2 will be then opposite of Q1. Now, because we're going to be adding some things up, let's um, Let's add a, another subscript here. 
Q11 and Q21. Right? So the first subscript is location of the force, and the second is the location of the displacement. Right? And so we'll have from our basic axial force deformation relationship here, we know that Q11 is equal to EA over L of the member times then delta 1. Right? And so we could simplify that down a little bit. And this will be our axial stiffness. So that would be just K times, well, we're also using here that symbol D rather than uh, delta. So KD1. And then the other one would end up being K times D1 also, but it would have a negative sign there for that Q2. And need to add that subscript here. Get that consistent. Right? Similarly, we do this with then the second nodal displacement pattern. We'll let then D1 equals 0, and then this one will be D2 as it comes out. And associated that with that will be, again, a set of nodal forces. This will be Q2, 2. And again, I know it seems kind of weird, but we're going to put Q at 1, associated with the displacement at 2, still acting to the right because that was our positive direction. And just like we had before, we'll get, okay, Q2, 2 will be equal then to K times D2 this time, and Q1, 2 will be equal to the opposite of Q2, 2, and that would then equal minus K times D2. Right? Now, in reality, our system that we have here is a series where we've got <coughs> Q1 and Q2. In general, again, those will probably be equal opposite. We'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. We'll have a set of displacement patterns that will be some displacement D1 and some displacement D2 that go along with those set of nodal forces. <coughs> and the final, then, is going to be the superposition of these two. So that means, of course, that Q1 equals Q11 plus Q12. So the force at 1 caused by the displacement at 1, but the other one is 0, and the force at 1 caused by the displacement that happens at 2 with D1 being equal to 0. So those two are added together. And note that that would then mean we'd have that equal to K times D1 minus K times D2, or K times D1 minus D2, which actually should make a lot of sense, right? That the, remember that D1 and D2 are not deformations, they are displacements. So the deformation, the axial deformation, is the difference between these two. Right now, if 1 is larger than 2, we get a positive value to here. That means we'd end up really with compression that Q1 would be squeezing, pushing to the right. And that's what this would show us. Right? If D2 is larger, then the Q1 value is going to turn out to be negative or opposite as it is shown. And of course, if D2 is larger than D1, that means that we're going to end up with tension in the member. And so Q1 would be going in the other direction. So that physically uh, makes sense. Now Q2 is going to be then, again, by superposition, we've got Q21 plus Q22. And then when we substitute in there, we get a minus K times D1 plus K times D2, which would, of course, be equal to the same thing as the difference 
between those two. So these two turn out to be equal opposite, which is what we would expect up here as well. Notice again this difference. We're, we're breaking down the simple thing that in general delta equals NL over EA into now tying everything to the specific displacements at the ends that will then ultimately form what that uh, deformation is. Now in matrix form then what we would have is that the first equation would tell us that if we have a set of nodal forces of Q1 and Q2 then and the displacements at the ends, the same locations, D1 and D2, that these are all related then by the axial stiffness of the member, right, where K equals EA over L of the member. That's what we've got here. Check it out again. <clears throat> we've got K times D1 minus K times D2 would equal Q1, and then likewise for the second equation. What that's going to look like numerically for our example structure, we had two members that were really identical, and so for the first member, we have to put the subscripts one and one in there. I could factor that out. You see that here out of that stiffness matrix where that K1 is EA over L of that member one, and numerically that was EA over L was 966.6 .6 repeating kips per inch. And because both members were identical, we ended up with the same looking or numerical values for that um, member stiffness matrix. Next, we'll take this and put this all together into something that um, is now representative of the entire system. Meaning, we got to take these little member stiffness matrix matrices and assemble them, which is what the drug stiffness method is really all about, into this big structural um, equation.